In the West, we generally celebrate May 8th as VE Day, or Victory in Europe Day, the day that the Allies accepted the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany in Europe, although the Soviet Union chose to celebrate May 9th instead. And while, of course, the war went on for several more months in the Pacific, many people don't realize that VE Day did not represent the end of combat operations in Europe, because despite the ostensible unconditional surrender, there were still German units in the field for months after VE Day. And one of the largest of those was a mixed column of Germans, Croatians, and collaborationist civilians who were fleeing the, the wrath of Yugoslav partisans and trying to make it to Austria where they could surrender to the British. The battles of Poljana and Odzak, which uh, represent the, the bloody, vicious civil war that was fought in Yugoslavia inside the broader context of the Second World War, are considered by many historians to be the last battles in Europe of the Second World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. After World War I and the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the state of Yugoslavia was formed from the Slav word for South, Yug, as a nation for Southern Slavs. But during the interwar years, the nation struggled with political instability. And the Croatian parliament never ratified the unification. Ethnic tensions, especially between Croats and Serbs, were latent and deeply rooted. King Alexander I of Yugoslavia, a Serb, was assassinated in France in 1934 by a marksman, supported in part by the Ustaza, a fascist Croatian nationalist organization. The regent, Prince Paul, tried to steer a neutral course after Germany invaded Poland, but he was overthrown in a coup d'etat at the end of March 1941. Less than two weeks later, the Axis powers invaded. Yugoslavia was invaded from all sides by Germany, Hungary, and Italy. The Ustaza within the country had been encouraged by the Nazis in the lead-up to the attack, and an 11-day campaign ended with the various regions of the country signing an armistice at Belgrade. The Axis powers split Yugoslavia, with Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria annexing portions of it. The Croatian Ustaza formed a large puppet or client state. Montenegro became an Italian protectorate, and Serbia was occupied by Germany. The Ustaza regime sought a racially pure Croatia and massacred and expelled Jews, Serbs, Romani, and political dissidents. They forced hundreds of thousands to convert to Catholicism in an attempt to eliminate the Eastern Orthodox religion, which they saw as representing Serbian nationalism from the country. A Croatian home guard was formed, but the more effective Croatian units were the Ustaza militia. Two major Yugoslav resistant groups formed to conduct guerrilla operations throughout the war. The Communist Yugoslav partisans, led by Josef Tito, and the pro-Serbian royalist Chetniks, who supported the exiled King Peter, but they didn't always have the same goals. Tito had served in the Austro-Hungarian army in World War I, but was severely wounded and captured by the Russians. In 1941, when the Axis invaded, he was living under an assumed name and wanted by the government for his communist activities. Tito remained underground until June, when the Wehrmacht invaded Russia. On July 4th, Tito's uprising began. He put out a call to the country. Peoples of Yugoslavia, Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Montenegrins, Macedonians, and others, now is the time. The hour has struck to rise like one man in the battle against the invaders and hirelings, killers of our people. Do not falter in the face of an any enemy terror. Answer terror with savage blows at the most vital points of the fascist occupation bandits. Initially, the Chetniks and partisans shared an uneasy truce, but by October of 1941, they were in open conflict. The Chetniks saw the pan-ethnic Yugoslavia as anti-Serbian, and the communist partisans would not support the old monarchy. Leading the partisans, Tito created the largest resistance army in Eastern Europe, 800,000 strong by the war's end, and one of the most successful. The Germans repeatedly attempted to squash Tito's guerrilla movement, especially in seven extensive and coordinated campaigns called the Seven Enemy Offensives, but every time they failed. Early in the war, the Allies supported the Chetniks, but by 1943 it became clear that Tito's partisans were a more effective force. Before 1944, the Allies could provide only occasional and limited material assistance along with some agents on the ground. In November of 1943, Winston Churchill expressed his regret the Allies had not supported the partisans earlier. It was lamentable fact that virtually no supplies had been conveyed by sea to the 220,000 followers of Tito. These stalwarts were holding as many Germans in Yugoslavia as the combined Anglo-American forces were holding in Italy, south of Rome, he said. Until 1944, the fighting itself was almost entirely on the partisans' backs, and despite violent reprisals and offensives, the partisans remained a constant and serious thorn in the side of Germans and their Stasa allies. 
1944, the Allies started supporting partisan efforts with air support from Italy. Recognizing the primacy of the partisans, the Yugoslav government in exile signed a treaty that attempted to reconcile the royalist Chetniks with the partisans and named the partisan soldiers the regular army of Yugoslavia. King Peter urged the country to join the National Liberation Army under the leadership of Marshal Tito. By March of 1945, the partisans controlled most of the country, though still in separate pockets, and Tito was recognized by the Allies as the Prime Minister of the country. Tito also put together a deal for the Soviets to temporarily enter Yugoslavia to assist a partisan offensive on Serbia that culminated in the capture of Belgrade. Declining Axis fortune saw collaboration governments in Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria fall. The German and Axis-aligned governments in Yugoslavia had spent most of their time in control undertaking a vicious program of genocide against Jews, Romani, and other ethnic groups, eventually killing at least a million people. Heinrich Himmler described the Estaza crimes as bestial and sadistic. The soldiers and collaborators knew that they could not expect good treatment under a Tito-led government, and like many German soldiers, feared capture by the Soviets. Despite orders to surrender, the German commander ordered the soldiers to retreat to Austria and the lines of Western allies, whom they believed would be more tolerant. The situation for anti-partisans and excess troops was grim in 1945. The Germans had lost everything south of Sarajevo and only held the city at great cost because it presented the only corridor through which German forces could retreat north. They held the city until April 15th. Fighting across the country had broken down into an all-out civil war between the remaining local forces, variously led by Serb, Slovene, Croatian, and political hostile groups. A battle at Levica field between Chetnik royalists and a combined Ustasa Croatian force ended with a major Chetnik defeat, a fight in which both sides feared partisan troops who were massing nearby. The final offensive was organized by Tito and began on March 20th, with the objective connecting the many pockets of control across the country and smashing remaining Axis, Chetnik, and Ustasa resistance. They primarily fought the remnants of German Army Group E, which included a Ukrainian SS unit, Slovenian Home Guard, the survivors of the Levice field, both Chetnik and Ustasa, Serbian remnants, and a myriad of other anti-partisan forces. Fighting continued despite the surrender of Alexander Lohr, commander of Army Group E, on May 9th, when his soldiers were surrounded in Volinia, less than 50 kilometers from the Austrian border. Intact Chetnik forces attempted a breakthrough at Zelengara, hoping to find safety in Serbia. Some 6,000 Chetniks attacked the partisan lines, but were decisively defeated on May 13th, and most of their force wiped out. This defeat caused the de facto disintegration of the Chetniks as a political group. The next day, on the other side of the country, some 30,000 retreating Axis soldiers met partisan positions near the small village of Poljana, in modern-day Slovenia, only a few kilometers from the Austrian border. The Axis troops demanded free passage west, and when they were refused, they attempted to break through the line. Fighting intensified throughout the night, only halting the next morning when 20 British tanks arrived from Austria. Negotiations with the British made it clear that the Axis forces would receive no better treatment in Austria, and that their only option was unconditional surrender. White flags were waved by 4 p.m. The brief fighting had caused an estimated 500 casualties to the Axis, and as few as 100 on the side of the partisans. Though the battle at Poljana was often been called the last battle of World War II in Europe, fighting wasn't over yet. Further south, the partisans encircled the small town of Odjak. On the 19th of April, the Staza forces chose to defend the town instead of following German forces fleeing to Austria. Odzak was strategically between two rivers, which made it easy to fortify, and the Croat units were well supplied with ammunition. The Ustaza remnants built bunkers, trenches, and minefields, and covered everything with barbed wire. Reports vary, but the force was estimated to have been between 1,800 and 4,000 soldiers. The partisans had mostly bypassed the town on their way north, but by May turned their attention back to one of the last vestiges of resistance in the country, and indeed the continent. Despite the surrender of nearly all other Axis forces, the enclave of fascist Croats refused to surrender. Here the complexity of the conflict in the Balkans comes into greater focus. The Nazis had taken advantage of latent sympathies and animosities that already existed in the region, in addition to bringing their own. Many different ethnic-oriented nationalists and independent groups existed in the interwar years, supporting the breakup of Yugoslavia for a variety of reasons. The Ustasa sought an independent Croatia through racial purity and violence. The partisans sought to create a communist state that united the various ethnicities of the region. The late war conflicts in many parts of Europe can be understood as political maneuvering for the era that was about to begin. The Estaza, knowing what fate awaited them, chose instead to fight. 
During April, the Estaza soldiers held out and killed 630 partisans, including an entire battalion, and destroyed three batteries of Yugoslav artillery. The Serbian newspaper reported that the enemy was much more dangerous and insidious than a German soldier. The Estaza fight to the death. The partisans had limited artillery support, no air support throughout most of April and May, and the Croatian soldiers beat off several attacks. It wasn't until May 23rd that a limited number of planes could be brought in to provide air support. Under heavy assault from the planes and close-range artillery and many thousands of partisans, the defenses finally fell. Casualty reports vary wildly, and the partisans were said to have lost between 1,200 and 10,000 soldiers in the siege. Nearly all of the Estasa were killed. The battle ended on May 25th. 17 days after the official victory in Europe Day. While the world hoped for the return of peace, what followed in Yugoslavia was intense violence. Massacres were carried out across the country against former Istaza, Germans, and collaborationist elements, including a massacre of survivors of Otjak. Some escapees would fight in the area until 1947, when the last soldier was captured and killed in Lipa. In the north, the massacres were even worse. The partisans beat the Allies to the former Italian Istria and the city of Trieste, where the FOIB massacres against fascists or fascist-linked soldiers and civilians were carried out. Perhaps the worst of the massacres occurred to the survivors of the Battle of Pliena and others turned over to Yugoslavia by the British at Bleiburg, called the Bleiburg Repatriations. Members of all the fascist-aligned groups were massacred, at least 30,000 according to journalist Marcus Tanner, author of Croatia, A Nation Forged in War. In all, as many as 100,000 were killed in reprisals, though Tito's regime never had an official policy of genocide. Historians disagree on the numbers killed during the war, but a tentative consensus is that at least a million were killed, including the majority of the region's Jewish population. The Battle of Odzak, now considered by many historians to be the very final battle of the Second World War in Europe, was kept hidden by the Yugoslav government and was almost unknown until local sources started uncovering more information and reporting on it in the 1970s. The story just didn't fit into the narrative that the incoming communist government wanted to tell, calling for unity among the Yugoslav peoples, and there was a concern that the long and relatively successful defense against larger numbers might inspire the Croatian separatist movement. The fighting in Yugoslavia, sometimes called a civil war separate from the greater world war, provided a good example of how World War II was fought locally in regions all over the planet. The war had enormous consequence for countries and peoples for the rest of the 20th century and involved much more than just the Germans and the Allies, but many local interest groups who fought with or against each other in the pursuit of power and convenience. In some ways, Yugoslavia was relatively unique because it received relatively little Allied assistance until late in the war, and so the struggle was mostly fought with local forces. But in many ways, it was representative of many other struggles that were occurring throughout the world. For example, the ongoing civil war in China at the time and the upcoming civil wars in places like Greece and Southeast Asia, and of course the many communist and socialist organizations that were setting themselves up for power in the post-war world. And all of these groups that were looking to shift the balance of power in the later stages of the war in order to impact the question of what comes next impacted the legacy of the larger picture of the Second World War, and mired it in these local conflicts and these reprisals and massacres that occurred in the days after the war powerfully affected the post-war world into the next century and they're still relevant today. Today in Trieste, the study or even discussion of the massacres that occurred in the days following the war is still a matter of great controversy. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.